So we are in week five of a series, I Love My Church. If you have not been here with us, if you're uh, visiting with us today, we're in a five-week series that we're wrapping up today, just taking ownership of this church, where we came from, where we, where we stand, and where are we going. And so uh, Phil Wiseman, our, our uh, downtown campus pastor, did an amazing job unpacking our history of our denomination, the Wesleyan denomination. The last three weeks, we talked about our core values, worship free of inhibition, live free of sin, serve free of self. What does that mean for us? How do I live that out in my life? Today, uh, we're going to jump into the future. We're going to talk about, I love where we're going. And let me begin with a question. Where are you going in life? I don't know what you dream about. I don't know what it is you feel God is calling you to do, but I do know this. You will not get there by accident. There's a saying out there, uh, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And I, find, I see that lived out in life after life after life and played out in church after church after church. And a lot of it comes down to poor leadership, poor church leadership, poor self-leadership. So what does that actually mean? Well, leadership is kind of a buzzword in our culture, in our church right now. Uh, some go way too far one way and they make the church all about leadership development and they make it, you know, the church becomes a business and the pastor's the CEO and, and we're not talking about that at all. But on the other side, there's a group, there, you, know, you go too far the other way and you make leadership like a, a dirty word. You, know, like you don't say the L word in church. And, and uh, the result then is no leadership. There are churches that are going nowhere and are aiming at nothing and they're hitting it every time. And, and so somewhere in the midst of this, uh, you know, there's a balance. And that leads back to my question, what is leadership? Well, there's probably you know, a thousand definitions out there. Today, we're going to oversimplify for our purposes. We're going to use a definition that comes from Bill Hybels, uh, a concept he taught a few years ago at Willow Creek Leadership Conference in Chicago. And, and this is, this is uh, pretty you know, brilliant. You're going to want to write this down. It's pretty astute. Uh, he said, leadership is taking people from here to there. That's it. That's what the definition is. Leadership is taking people from here to there. All leaders, no matter what field you're in, no matter what area of life, even pastors, this is ultimately all that leaders do. They get people from here to there. And so as a pastor, it is my call. I'm called, uh, and we are, as pastors here, empowered by the Holy Spirit to move our church from here to there, to move us from our current state towards God's preferred future. And that's true both personally. We want people to personally journey with us and personally grow in their faith uh, within their families, but also as a community of faith. Now, that might sound quite simple. I assure you it is not. In fact, the truth is uh, most approach this task backward. Uh, this, maybe you've been a part of this scenario. A pastor will get a vision from the Lord uh, for the church and where the church is supposed to go, and the pastor will call a meeting of key leaders or elders, or maybe he'll just even gather the whole congregation and, and, and do a sermon like this uh, and, and begin to describe where God is calling the church, where he wants them to go. And after casting this amazing, compelling, God-given vision, he'll turn to the people, expecting excitement, say, well, what do you think? And the group response will be, we don't want to go there. We, we like it here. And a lot of times a pastor uh, will walk away discouraged and defeated and he or she will go back to God and say, well, did I hear you right? Was I, did I miss it? What, was it the pizza I ate? Did I have indigestion? I don't know. Like what was, you know, no, I think I heard you right. I think this is correct. So God, what are you, what are you really saying? What went wrong? I know, maybe I wasn't passionate enough. And so then they'll come back and, and the next week and they'll, they'll teach the same thing, but they'll turn it up like 100 or 500 or 1,000 degrees. You know, this passionate, wholehearted, and they turn around, and now people are not just saying no. Now their whole bodies are saying no. You know, they're like, you know, arms crossed, slunched down. We don't want to go there. We like it here. And, and either the pastor gives up at this point, or he keeps cranking up the heat until something explodes, right? The people are mad at the pastor. The pastor's mad at those terrible, selfish people. And the sad part is God really did give that pastor a vision of where the church needed to go. It was just mishandled so nobody could receive it. Now, that's not a new phenomenon. Since the beginning of time, since the beginning of recorded history, people, mankind has refer, preferred here to there. Here is, I'm already here. I'm comfortable. Why would I go there? Okay? That's just normal. Okay? And so we're going to look at Scripture. Uh, we're going to take Moses and the nation of Israel as an example. Turn with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 3. If you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 36. Uh, if you want to follow along, you can raise your hand. The ushers will bring you a Bible, uh, and you can just use it and return it or keep it if you don't own one. Uh, Exodus 3, page 36. This passage lays the foundation for where we're going, uh, and, and this is the story of Moses' called to lead the Israelites. And it, it starts out in a rather profound way. God speaks to Moses from a burning bush. Now, I wish God was ever that clear with me. Has God ever been that clear with you? 
No, I, I wish, but God speaks to Moses from a burning bush and he clarifies a call in Moses as his leader. And it's a call to lead God's people from here to there. So we're going to jump in Exodus chapter three, starting with verse one. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you're standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, I think it's ironic that he didn't, wasn't afraid when a burning bush was talking to him, but whatever. Um, <laughs> then the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering, so I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. That's God's plan, okay? It's a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, watch, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. So it's right there. God says, you must lead my people from here to there. So Moses follows God's call. He goes to Egypt. He does exactly what most leaders do. He stands up in front of the people. He shares his big plan. He says, here's what God called me to do. I'm going to lead you out of slavery. Uh, we're going to get out of here. I'm going to take you from here to the promised land. It's going to be amazing. You just need to trust me. And like our scenario, Moses turns around and says, what do you think? And the group response is, we don't want to go there. See, they, didn't re they, they rejected him as their leader. They didn't trust him. Now, listen, Israel doesn't see it. You, what you need to understand is they weren't at the burning bush, okay? They didn't hear the voice of God. They're just hearing the voice of Moses. And he's telling them, leave what you know and do something that you don't know. Go somewhere you don't know. And they're counting the cost and they're like, mm, I don't think so. Now, let me give you a little background, a little snapshot of the nation of Israel. This is a nation that up to this point in history has never known freedom as a nation. See, before slavery, they weren't a nation. They were just a really big family. Early in the Old Testament, you read a story about Joseph and his brothers, and his brothers hate him, so they sell him into slavery in Egypt. And through God's ordaining work, he comes to power in Egypt. Eventually, he comes to be like second in command in Egypt. His family comes, they reconcile, and his whole family moves to Egypt, and they begin to grow larger and larger. Well, Joseph dies, his family's still growing. A new Pharaoh comes to power in Egypt. He doesn't know anything about Joseph. He doesn't know anything about his family. He just sees this growing nation and he's threatened by them and he enslaves them. So as a nation, they have never known anything but slavery and bondage. Now, luckily, Moses didn't have to go into round two and turn up the heat here. God does that through the 10 plagues. You know those, you've seen the movie, right? Moses, Mo you know. Um, and Pharaoh finally, 10 plagues, Pharaoh lets the people go and the Israelites go, huh, Maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. Like, maybe we should follow him. So they decide to. They decide to follow him out of Egypt into the wilderness. And as they are leaving, Pharaoh changes his mind, begins to chase them. So now they're trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh. They don't know what to do. God parts the Red Sea. Two to three million people cross through on dry land. The Egyptians try to follow. He closes the water and drowns the Egyptians. And for the first time in their history, the people of God are finally free. Now that brings us all the way up to Exodus 15. And at the beginning of Exodus 15, we see the Israelites worshiping God. Exodus 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord for he's triumphed gloriously. He hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's given me victory. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. They're pumped. They're worshiping him. The problem is they change their tune pretty quickly. Okay, Praising turns to protesting by mm, about verse 22. So they made up 21 verses. Good for you, Israel. Um, and here's why. Because they leave the Red Sea. They, they have this worship party, right? And then they leave the Red Sea. Moses leads them out into the desert where they wander in the desert, they wander in the wilderness for three days with no water, okay? They finally come to a place, 
called Mara, which means bitter, and they complain against Moses because they finally find water, but it's too bitter to drink. So here they are in the middle of the desert. Moses has the vision. They do not. They just know they're uncomfortable. Mark Batterson describes it this way. After 400 years of slavery, God delivers the Israelites out of Egypt, but it's harder, much harder getting Egypt out of the Israelites than getting the Israelites out of Egypt. Despite the memories of slavery and miracles of deliverance, the Israelites want to go back to Egypt. So they start complaining in verse uh, 24. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink, they demanded. Now, let me tell you how that roughly translates. What are we going to drink, they demanded. Like, they're like, what, what is your plan here, knucklehead? There's no water. What, did, what are you going to do now? See, they've forgotten how terrible Egypt was. They've forgotten God's promise. They're just blinded by their current condition. They're thirsty. And this starts causing doubt. And so they're no longer looking forward. Now they're looking back. Now, I wish I could say this was a one-time thing with Egypt or with Israel. Uh, but over and over through the Exodus, uh, we see this. Exodus 16, God has provided manna, literally sent bread from heaven. Okay? And, and they start complaining that they want something else. Exodus chapter 17, they're in a place called Rephidim. There's no water. And so they start complaining. God sends water out of a rock. Over and over, God provides miraculously, and over and over, they complain. And their complaint is always the same. I wish we would have stayed in Egypt. Now, it's easy to look at them and go, what's their problem? But I want to suggest that this is where most churches are. Now, not, of, not our church, of course. We're perfect. But other churches, like, you know, I, they, they didn't see the vision. They're just following Moses. And so he has a vision of where they're going. They just have a memory of where they've been, and they don't want to go there. They want to stay here. Jeff Mannion is an author who wrote a book called The Land Between. In that book, he says this. He said, the land between is where life was not, want, uh, not what it once was. The future is in question. And in that situation, in that season of uncertainty, it's human nature to just hold on to what we know rather than risk on what we can't see. Mannion writes this. As we pass through the land between, it's critical to recognize not simply the hardship, but our reaction to the hardship is forming us. With each discomfort we experience, our responses both reveal the person we are and set the trajectory for the person we're becoming. Now, I want to hit the pause button on this story, and today I want to, I want to dream with you a little bit, and I want to do so. I want to share with you where we're going, and I want to do so in a way that leaves you saying, I love where we're going. And so in a little while here, I'm going to challenge you to get behind that dream. But I'm going to challenge you to get behind it physically, both in when and where you worship. I'm going to challenge you to get behind it emotionally and financially and spiritually. But before we can dream about where we're going, first we have to have another important conversation. The problem with so many leaders uh, is that we get this grand vision from God and we spend all our time telling you where we're going to go, but we miss the most crucial conversation that most leaders miss, that Moses missed. Before anyone can be willing to go there, they have to know why we can't stay here. Okay. Before you can say, hey, we're going to go there. It's going to be great. Before anybody's like excited about that, they have to understand first, well, why can't we stay here? I like here. Why can't we stay here? So turn with me to Numbers chapter 11. It'll be on page 89. Page 89. And this is a continuation of the same story, just in, a, in another book of the Bible. Numbers 11, starting with verse 4. And this is where, by the way, I think the story gets really fun. Then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites begin to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also begin to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. And we had all the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna. Just bread from heaven, bread from heaven. Miracle, miracle, miracle all the time. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? But here, here's the point. When you have no vision of where you're going, you will always long for where you've been. It's just human nature. The people were complaining of hardship. Anybody grumble when things get hard? You know, don't poke anybody next to you or say, yes, you, you know. The Israelites were grumbling. They were not loving wandering in the wilderness. They were not happy with what they had to eat. Now, God is literally sending bread from heaven. All they have to do in the morning is open up their tent flap, walk outside, and pick it up. And eventually they begin to complain about that. But by the way, that's just human nature. Let me give you an example. If you went home from church today, and instead of going in your house, you walked across the street to your neighbor's house, and you knock on the door, and they open up, you say, hey, I just want to be a blessing to you, so I'm going to give you $10. They would probably like that. They think you're a good neighbor. They'd be, this is amazing. Why are you doing this? I don't understand. What a blessing, right? Let's say then tomorrow you do the same thing. Same time. Hey, I just want to bless you. I'm, I'm, here's 10 bucks, right? 
they'd still be blown away. But if you continue to do this a week, two weeks, three, a month, pretty soon they're waiting by the door, right? And then what happens when you skip the first day? What gives? Where's my $10, right? And it's not that they deserve it, not that they earned it. They've become entitled to it. They expect it. That's just human nature. We see that played out in the Israelites. Uh, We can see how they transition. When they begin to complain early on, they're complaining about no food and no water. That's legitimate, okay? Eventually, by Numbers 11, they're not complaining about lack of provision anymore. Now they're complaining about lack of variety. And, and that's just human nature. Listen, Moses described, hey, the promised land is going to be great. It's a place flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to get there. They don't have that vision like he did. They didn't see it. So they, he's got a vision of where they're going. They, they don't have that vision. They can't love where they're going. And when you can't love where you're going, you'll always long for where you've been. And so the people cried out, oh, if only we had meat to eat. Now, come on, let's just be honest. They were in slavery. They didn't have meat every day. It's not like they were going out to the steakhouse every night, you know? But this is what it happens. When we're chasing a new vision and it gets hard, we forget what God has done for us. We forget the miracles we've seen. We start romanticizing the way things work, right? We start to go, oh, that was great. Now, okay, so there was some meat sometimes. Have you forgotten you were slaves? They can't remember slavery. They can remember cucumbers, okay? That pretty much puts it in perspective. God was bringing them to a better place. He was supplying them with everything they needed. He was performing miracles. He was opening doors, but they couldn't see the big picture. All they could see is their personal discomfort, what they personally wanted. And by the way, how often do we do this? And I'm not talking about the Ransom Church. I'm talking about people in general. Can I just say, we live in the United States of stinking America. We are more blessed than any nation on earth ever. Yeah, it's a mess right now but we still have freedoms the world dreams about. You understand that? And we take it for granted every single day. Sitting in this room is one of those freedoms. And we take it for granted every single day. We've turned our back on the God upon whom our nation was founded, one nation under God. We've turned our back. I love Mark Batterson's summation of the situation. He says, talk about selective memory. The Israelites longingly remember the free fish they ate in Egypt and forget the little fact that the food was free because they weren't. The Israelites weren't just slaves. They'd been the victims of genocide, yet they missed the meat on the menu. And isn't it just a little ironic that the Israelites were complaining about one miracle while asking for another one? Their capacity for complaining was simply astounding, and we scoff at the Israelites for grumbling about a meal of manna that was miraculously delivered to their doorsteps every day, but don't we do the same thing? Now, I want you to watch God's response in Numbers chapter 11, verse 10. Moses heard all the family standing in the doorways of their tents whining, okay? And the Lord became extremely angry. I get that. I mean, can you imagine? God's chosen a group of people, the Israelites. He's delivered them from slavery, parted the Red Sea so they could cross, drowned the Egyptian enemies, provided water from a rock, bread from heaven, and they want to go back to slavery rather than embrace the vision God has for them. And listen, church, we do this all the time. When the Holy Spirit starts moving in a church, everyone can feel it, everyone's excited, until the Holy Spirit gives, starts giving the leadership a vision, and suddenly things start changing, and it's really, we really quickly go to, I, I don't want to change, I don't want to go there. And so we dig in our heels, and I want to hold on to what I know. I don't love where we're going, I love where I am. It's just, again, it's just human nature. Now, Moses' reaction is priceless. This is like my favorite part of the story. Verse 10, Moses was also very aggravated. And Moses said to the Lord, why are you treating me, your servant, so harshly? Have mercy on me. What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people? Now here, did I give birth to them? Did I bring them into this world? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby? How can I carry them to the land you swore to give to their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me, saying, give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me, right? <laughs> do me a favor and spare me this misery. Now, don't get me wrong. Moses is an incredible leader. In fact, God describes Moses as the most humble man on earth. I guarantee God's never said that to any of us, right? But he said it to Moses. But Moses was in rare condition this day. He's like, did I give birth to these people? Am I their mom? I'd rather you kill me than clean up after these people. You know, I mean, he's like, this is the day he's having. And so look at how God responds in verse 18. Say to the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow you'll have meat to eat. You were whining, And the Lord heard you when you cried, oh, for some meat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat 
and you will have to eat it. And you, it won't be just for a day or two or five or 10 or even 20. You'll eat it for a whole month until you gag and are sick of it. <laughs> Thus says the Lord, right? Uh, for you've rejected the Lord who's here among you and you've whined to him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Listen, God gave them what they wanted, which by the way was what they used to have, what they already had. And he didn't give them just a little bit. It says so much it made them sick. God had something new for them. He had a better th future for them, but they wanted what they always had. And so he gave it to them in so much abundance, they literally became sick to death of the very thing they originally desired. As the old lesson goes, be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. And this is where far too many churches are. We want the results of there, but we don't want to leave here. We want the promised land. We want the results of there, but we don't want to leave here. Here's the only problem, and this is the problem I think that we miss that we don't discuss. Here breaks the heart of God. That's why he's calling us there. The mistake Moses made, the mistake too many leaders make, is we, make, we get a vision of where God is taking us. We talk about how great there is going to be, and it's going to be great, but we never tell people the most important part. We can't stay here. Here breaks the heart of God. Now, I told you I was going to dream a little bit. I'm literally blessed to be able to say this. Ransom Church is not normal, okay? Uh, now, I'm completely biased, but I think this is the most amazing church I've ever been a part of. And over and over, I look around and I watch people step up to the plate and blow my mind with, with their sacrifice and their willingness and their generosity. The problem is not everybody's there yet. You're all at different stages, right? So uh, some are served like crazy, and then others, you, you go here, you love it here, but you don't want to go there. You don't want to jump in. You don't want to do all those things. Maybe that's where you find yourself. So please hear me when I say this. We can't stay here. Ransom is an amazing place, and every day we're advancing the kingdom, but please hear me when I say God has more planned. There are tons of people here who sacrifice like crazy to make this place amazing. They serve like crazy. They give like crazy. They stretch themselves like crazy. There's also a lot of people who just go to church here. They haven't engaged in what we're all about. They're not plugged in. They're not serving. They've never given anything, and God has great plans for our future, but until we let go of here, we can't go there, and, and we need to do that together. So let me give you some examples. We talk about South Campus, woot, woot, right? And hundreds of people have already said, I will go to South Campus. I'll go there. But there are many more who say something to me like, I don't want to go there, which is fine. If, but they don't say, I don't want to go there. I think God's called me to stay here. Cool, whatever. They, they say, I don't want to go there because I what? I like it here. I just like it too much here. Well, that's fine. I get that. But I think you're missing the point. And, and here's what I mean. Here, we have four services, we will very likely max out at five. Now, we added Saturday night service to offset the growth. And I want you to understand, on average, probably about 500 people go to Saturday night. Can you imagine squeezing 500 people into this room right now? Like we, we couldn't do it. And so we need these services. And many have gone there. We need more to go there. But, but uh, you know, many people say, well, I don't want to go to Saturday night. I like to worship on Sunday. I, I want to worship on Sunday. Well, I have a uh, huge news for you. Um, we, ha we have done Saturday services now for a year, and we ran into a problem. The problem is we need these Saturday services. We need these other service opportunities. But running Saturday night and Sunday night, these over two days like this, running the whole weekend like this, is, is killing our volunteers. It's killing their families. It's killing our staff. It's killing their families. Uh, I'll share a story as an example. We were sitting around talking about this as a staff, and uh, in a, in a moment of, of um, you know, just openness, one of the pastors said, I overheard my daughter talking to some friends of ours. And they were asking, how do you like the Ransom Church? How do you, oh, I love it. I love that dad's on staff. It's so cool. It's so great. But then her, the, his daughter said, except that dad's always leaving all weekend. Okay? And, and we began to have conversations. Yeah, my kids too, my kids too. And then we began to talk to volunteers. And, and what it occurred to us, I get one chance to raise my kids, Right? Every one of us gets one, we get one shot at this. We don't get another shot. And, and it didn't seem to make a lot of sense to us to reach hundreds for Christ while blowing up our staff's families, while blowing up our volunteers' families. That doesn't seem godly at all. And so, we, well, what do we do? Because on the one hand, we need these services. On the other hand, we can't blow up our staff families. And so we decided, and this is where you're going to want to write stuff down. Starting October 16th, we will be shifting schedules. And here's how the schedule's going to shift. Sunday morning is not going to change at all. 9.30 a.m., 11 a.m. But what we're going to do is we're going to take Saturday night, 4.30 and 6 p.m., and we're just going to shift it to Sunday night. 
So our new schedule will be Saturday, no services, Sunday, 9.30 and 11, 4.30 and 6. When we originally put Saturday night in place, we did so because of technology. Our Harrisburg campus was meeting in a portable location and could not get the videos unless we taped them ahead of time. Now they're going to be in South Sioux Falls in a permanent location, and the technology is different, so we can actually do this. And so we're going to move everything to Sunday night. And now if, if you're a volunteer in this room, uh, you have uh, training. If you're in guest services or kids, you have training tonight that you already know about. You're going to not want to skip that. You're going to want to be there because we're going to talk about the implications of how that changes, why we serve, and how we serve, and all that. Um, but you might be sitting in this room. Some, I know right now some in this room, about 50% of you are like, whatever, you know, like, that's fine. Uh, about 50 or 25 percent of you are like, sweet. I wanted I, I wanted to do the Saturday night thing, but I I just couldn't. But I could do Sunday night, and I'd be willing to go there. And then there are others of you who are like, I think this is a bad choice. And for that, I'm really sorry. But what you have to understand is we can't stay here. We have to go there. In fact, we need. I mean, look around this room right now. We need we need like a hundred hundred fifty people out of this room to choose to go to Sunday night. I mean, we just do, because. Guests don't come as much on Sunday night, but they will come during the day on Sunday. And it, it just matters too much. We need people to do this. And, and the reality of it is we make this switch, fine, great. If we, even if we have four services on Sunday, even if we add a fifth one on Sunday, eventually and quite soon, we'll be done. There will be no more room at downtown campus for people who need Jesus. Are you okay with that? I'm not okay with that. And, and that's where this begins to break the heart of God. And so please understand, the reason that we're doing South Campus, the reason we're doing West Campus, the reason that we're moving from Saturday night to Sunday night, and we're begging a bunch of you to go to Sunday night, 4.30 or 6, and serve there and be part of that, the reason we're doing that is so more people can find Jesus. The reason we're doing that is because we can't stay here. Does that make sense? Let me give you some other examples. So we talk about all these campuses. Um, in order to do campuses, I don't know if you know this, uh, buildings are not free. They're not giving them out. Okay, um, they, they actually charge, you know, like real money and stuff for them. And, and so um, we're doing South Campus. We're going to do a West Campus in the coming weeks. And we've done this before. In the coming weeks and months, we're going to issue a challenge to financially support these campuses. Now, for some people, that might mean a little bit of money, but it's a huge stretch for you. For some, you've got the means. God's given you the means to make a significant donation. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what God will lay on your heart, but we're going to challenge you to give like crazy. And some of you already give like crazy, but I got to be honest, there's a lot of you who come every week and you don't give anything. And it's time for that junk to stop. Because this vision is just so much bigger than just what's about you, okay? It's just bigger than that. Yes, it's expensive to do buildings. But the spiritual cost of no longer reaching people for Jesus just because we wanted to be comfortable, that's too high. The spiritual cost is far higher than the physical financial cost. So we're going we're gonna to do the expensive thing over here financially because it's the right thing spiritually. Another example, we talk about life groups and getting in a group, and, and I celebrate we have more people signed up for life groups than ever. We're well over 800 uh, people, and, and now we just got to get them there, and that'll be great. And, but life groups are a stretch for a lot of people, I'll be honest, because you know, for so many of us, you know, we grew up in church. You, you grow up, and you go on Sunday morning. You check the box. I was there, you know, and, and then you go to the buffet. It's what you do, um, and, and that's Sunday. And, and so it's a stretch. You know, midweek stuff, that's for kids. You know, that's youth group and stuff, but not for adults. We're busy, and so now we're talking about get involved midweek and stretch yourself. And, and if all you do is come on Sunday morning periodically, you'll never grow into who God made you to be. And so God's saying, no, I don't want you to stay here. I want you to go there because I have more for you. Here breaks my heart. Another example is we talk about serve free and you know, taking the shape test and finding your fit. Not just because we need more volunteers. I mean, we do. But ultimately, God has gifted every one of us and hardwired in us this DNA to serve. And when you don't serve, when that lies dormant in you, you become a consumer. It's just what happens. And God's heart begins to break because he made you for more. When you're not serving, God's saying, you know, you can't stay here. You need to go there. Let, let me sum it all up uh, with this question. Where is your here? Where is your here? In other words, where is that area in your life where God's heart is breaking because you've settled for less than all that he has for you? Where is your here? And do you have the courage to move forward, to join us in God's vision? Uh, some of you the wrestling match you need to have with God is, God, okay, I give up. I don't care what building you want me to worship in. South Campus, West Campus, Downtown Campus, Moon Campus, I don't care. Like, I'll, whatever. I'll just go. You just tell me where to go. It's not about me. I'll just go. I don't care if it's further. I'll just go. It doesn't make sense, but you just tell me and I'll go. Some of you, 
uh, need to go, okay, God, here's the deal. I don't want to ask you how you would have me be generous. Because I think if I ask you, then you'll probably tell me. And that will stink because you're going to tell me something I don't want to hear. But okay, God, whatever you want me to do, you tell me to be generous and I'll do it. Uh, we need people to serve wholeheartedly, to give recklessly and generously, to jump into life groups willingly, and to remove that great barrier that gets in our way, the barrier called comfort, and do whatever it takes to reach more people. Do whatever God calls us. Do you understand? There are 100,000 people in Sioux Falls who are facing eternity without Jesus Christ. I, I can't, that's what keeps me up at night. That's, that's what fuels me. And I'll be the first, I, I, let me just be honest. This whole multi-site campus like deal, it stinks. I don't even like it. What I like, what I prefer is what we're doing right now. I prefer to be together, to worship here. I think downtown campus, I think it's great. In fact, I think Ransom Church is the greatest place on earth. Eat your heart out, Disney, you know? Um, again, I'm biased. I don't want to go there. I love it here. There's only one problem. I love Jesus more. I love, I want to obey him. I want to honor him. And he's called me to reach as many lost people as humanly possible before this thing's done or before my life's done. And with, with my dying breath, I hope I'm still reaching people for Jesus. That's what drives me. That's what motivates me. And so, like, if we have to live in a world where we say, you know what, we're full, we're done, that's it, because we just want to stay here. If we're done reaching people for Jesus, I'm done. I resign, I quit, I'm done. We can't be, because this is God's call for the church. So we're going to, as, as comfortable as it is to stay here, we're going to go to services we don't want to go to. We're going to go to South Campus. We're going to do West Campus. We're going to change everything. We're going to raise money. We're going to do all these things because I love Jesus more, and he, here is breaking his heart. So we have to go there. I love where we're going. I want you to as well. The question is, will you go with us? So there's a, uh, in your weekly handout, there's a, a box, a uh, little box in the connect portion on the left side, on the inside there, uh, and it has three challenges in it, and maybe you'll respond to zero of these. That's between you and God. That's fine. But if God stirs you, maybe you will respond to one or two or three of these. And all these mean is that uh, we're going to follow up with you by email for each of these and just say, hey, you, we noticed you checked this box and we would like to help you take next steps. One of them is just this. I'll give. I don't know what that means, but I feel like God's stirring in my heart to give a significant gift beyond my tithe. And, and that scares me. And I don't know what that means, but I'll give. If you check that box, we're going to follow up with you and, and we're going to invite you to uh, to an experience that will help you begin to take next steps in learning about generosity. Some of you will check the box that says, I'll go. Okay, fine. I'll go to South Campus. Or maybe that will mean West Campus. Or maybe I'll go to South Campus and there, from there go to West Campus and I'll just help these campuses get launched. It's not about me. It's about what you want, God. Check that. We'll follow up with you. Some of you are just saying, well, okay, I'll get involved. I've been, I've been riding the pine. I've been coming. I've been enjoying it. It's time for me to get some skin in the game and, and I'm going to serve you, you sign that. We're going, to take, we're going to send you the shape test. You can take it, find your ministry fit, and we're going to help you find that perfect place for you to serve. Because at the end of the day, I can't, I can't be okay with not reaching more people for Jesus. And I hope you're with me on that. Let me pray for you. God, would you just give us the courage? Would you give us the, the courage to uh, just keep reaching people for you? Would you give us the courage to not get comfortable and to, and to say, you know, I know it's more comfortable here. I, I don't really want to go there or give to that or do whatever but the kingdom is bigger. And for the sake of reaching people who don't know you, God, it makes it all worth it. Would you call us all to that equally, I pray in your name. Amen.